So let's talk about angels. So what do we know? We have dealt with quite a few things. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the relationship between God, I mean, I'm sorry, between man versus angels. Um, somebody had actually asked this question last week. I'm not sure if it was Diane, somebody anyway. And so I wanted to make sure I mentioned this. If you look at Hebrews chapter two, verse 58, you'll see where it's talking about both Jesus as well as mankind, so to speak. And it's talking about the fact that God made man a little lower than the angels, the word of God says. We know they're more powerful than us, uh, but that's not a permanent estate. But for now, let's look at Hebrews chapter number two and look at verses five through eight. For he has not put the world to come of which we speak in subjection to angels, but one testified in a certain place saying, what is man that you are mindful of him or the son of man that you take care of him? You have made him a little lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor and set him over the works of your hands. You have put all things in subjection under his feet. So what we know is that God in his creative order put Jesus, as we saw, ultimately supreme over all, and then the angels, and then he made man a little lower. Now, in this context, it's talking about Jesus. So you say, well, how could he be a little lower if we know that he's sovereign? Remember, he clothed himself in humanity. He took on a temporary assignment. Think of it like that, where remember uh, that show Undercover Boss? He really the CEO, but he go and act like he gone and flip some burgers so he can fit in with everybody else. In the spirit, that's what Jesus did. Because in order to redeem us from the curse of sin and death, he had to come into the earth realm as a man to be able to take back what the enemy had stolen from us when we uh, fell in the garden. So he came in the form of a man. That meant he had to humble himself. He lowered himself on our behalf. And that's really a quote if you go back and look at Psalm 8, eight uh, and I think it's actually 4 through 6. Pardon me, I left on my dash. Uh, this is a quote. If you have it in your Bible, uh, what I just read, you'll probably see in the middle of uh, verse 6 where it kind of sets it apart. That's Whenever you see that, that means it's quoting another verse in the Bible, and it's quoting Psalm 8. Okay. So Jesus as a man versus God. So as I said, he clothed himself in humanity, took on a temporary assignment, lowering himself on our behalf so that he could perfect our lives and our future by surrendering, or submitting himself as a man and then dying on our behalf. He purchased our souls. So look at Philippians chapter two, because while he was man, he was still all God. He was all man and still all God. Look at chapter two of Philippians. I'm going to read verses five down through 11. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, right there, what does that tell us? He is God. He is God. Being in the form of God did not consider robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bond servant and, be, and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. So we see he made himself of no reputation. He clothed himself in humanity that we might have life. And so he humbled himself. He was God, is God, but he took on the clothing, if you will, of a man. And then verse nine says, therefore God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow, of those in heaven, that would be you angels, and of those on earth, and of those under the earth, 
that would be the fallen angels and those who end up in hell. And that every tongue should confess that Jesus is the Lord, is Lord to the glory of God the Father. I always say you can bow now or you can bow later, but you will bow. He is Lord. He is Lord of all. So while he humbled himself as a man to lower himself for our behalf, he is given a name that is above every name. And God exalted him so that after he tasted death for us, he, of course, sits now at the right hand of the Father. And he is supreme over all. So while he temporarily was lower, we, on the other hand, also are temporarily lower. And I'm going to show you that in scripture. But our temporary is a little longer than his temporary. Okay. So man, watch this, has dominion over the earth. When you look back, remember what I read in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 5, it talked about the fact that the Hebrew, I mean, the angels, let me read it again. For he has not put the world to come of which we speak in subjection to angels. In other words, God is not saying they're going to rule over everybody in the future. That's not the case. In the future, Jesus will be who we bow before as the son of God. But let's look at what man was given. In Job chapter 7, verse 17, it's kind of almost a replication of what the psalmist said in Psalm 8. But Job is sort of pontificating or thinking or kind of speaking out loud, just like the psalmist did, you know, quandary, you know, here's God, maker of heaven and earth, ruler of all, almighty God. What is man that you're mindful of him? They were saying, why would you even think about us? But he created us in his image. He loves us with an everlasting love. And so while we are lower than the angels, we are highly esteemed in God's sight. So in Job, 717, it says, what is man that you should exalt him, that you should set your heart on him? Now, why you bother with man? Because God loves us like that. You ought to give yourself a hug and say, God loves me like that. And look at it. He said that you should exalt him. Well, wait a minute. You just said you made him a little lower than the angels. But look at what God did. Go back to the beginning. What was God's intent for mankind? Before we fell and God had to send his son to redeem us from our fallen state, we had a place that now has been restored. Verse 28. Then this was after he created the man and the female. Well, it says he created man. And create that's why man is a more generic term than you know male, but he created them male and female. Verse 27 says, but then verse 28 says, then God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it, have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on earth. So you as mankind. We have dominion over the earth. So God has exalted us. It is his will that we would subdue the earth, that we would have dominion over the earth. That we, you know, when you look in Malachi 3, not only did he want us to have dominion, but he wanted us to produce godly offspring. He wanted his seed to be replicated all over the earth. For Unfortunately, we've allowed the seed of the enemy and all the foolishness that's contrary to the things of God to be replicated all over the earth. But it was his desire that we fill the earth with the glory of God, fill the earth with those who love him by producing godly offspring. And so we have dominion over all the plants, all the fish, all the animals. I heard a very sad story about a lady who passed away. And I thought, my Lord, her house was on fire. And she was a nurse and uh, she works with my girl, worked with my girlfriend who uh, practices medicine. Anyway, her house was on fire. Her husband and she woke up, it sounds like middle of the night, jumped up. He went one way, she went another. I don't know what their plan was. She ran to get the dogs. 
Now, can I tell you I love dogs, but not enough to die? She unfortunately perished with those dogs. Sometimes we have exalted animals to a place that God didn't even put them. We have a generation, I say, who abort the babies and then raise the dogs. You got them in strollers and special hats and diamond tiaras and diamond necklaces, all kind of crazy over dogs. But then we go and say, it's my body, so I get to kill the baby. Something wrong with that picture. But that's a whole nother issue. Point is, we have dominion over all that God created. That's what he called us. That's why we are kingdom, a kingdom of kings and priests. So what's the future look like? It's not for them to reign, as I read in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 5. Uh, it's not for the angels to have dominion in the future. When are we talking about? We're talking about the day of the Lord when Christ returns. He, they're not going to have dominion. Jesus will have dominion. We already saw it. Every knee shall bow. Every tongue shall confess. But I wanted to highlight this verse in chapter 3, 2 Peter, verse 13. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look forward to new heavens and a new earth, which righteousness in which righteousness dwells. In the future, when he talks about uh, in Hebrews 2 and 5 that they are not intended to reign at that time, he's talking about when Jesus returns and we have a new heaven and a new earth. Okay, that's a whole nother teaching, but at least you understand that Jesus is Lord over all. Here's another distinction between man and angels. Angels aren't saved. Look at Romans chapter 8. And three, angels are spirit beings. They are not able to be saved. First of all, they don't need to be saved because they are created to do God's will. So that the ones that didn't fall or rebel have no sin in them to be redeemed for. Romans 8 and 3, for what the law could not do it in that it was weak through the flesh. They don't have flesh. They're spirit that take on a form of flesh. They can appear like a man, but they aren't men. God did, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh on account of sin. What's the point? Of, uh, he condemns sin in the flesh. What's the point? That doesn't apply to angels. They don't have any flesh. They don't have a soul as we would think of it. They're just created beings that worship and serve our God, and they come to serve us as we saw. So, we are currently considered to be a little lower than them. Uh-oh. That last one is kind of low. I apologize. It says equal in the end. Equal in the end. Look at Luke chapter 10. In other words, we're not going to always be lower than them. Remember, we looked at that scripture that talked about how we will judge the angel. I looked in a little deeper, uh, and one of the things that I understand or believe is the premise behind that, because somebody said, why are we going to judge angels? I said, I don't know. Think about it. The fallen angels will be judged. The fallen angels will be sent into hell and the lake of fire. So we will judge the fallen angels is my understanding. But let's look at it. In the end, we'll be equal. Now he started out, we're a little lower. But look at Luke chapter 10. And this is Jesus speaking. And look at verse number 34. It says, so he went to him, oh no, that's not what I want. Hold up, I think I've made a typo. Let me see, let me see. Do, 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 do. Anyway, it says that we will be equal to them. Hold up, I made a typo. Let me look up, see if I can find it. Um, do, 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 do. 
Sing with me now. <laughs> Amen. Uh, where did I just see that Holy Ghost? Help me, help me, help me. Help me, help me, help me. Mm -hmm. Okay, let me try a different avenue. I wrote, I should have written it down when I saw it. Oh, here it is. Was that it? Okay, put a pen in that and let me look real quick. Um, we will be equal with them at the resurrection is what the scripture says. Okay, look at Matthew. I think this is the parallel that I'm looking for. I know there's a Luke version. But let me see, for sake of moving, I'm going to settle for Matthew. Matthew 22, let's see, Matthew 22, 30. Now it says that for in the resurrection, Matthew 22 and 34 in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in the in marriage but are like angels of God in heaven uh, and the verse that I'm looking for says a little more directly but the essence is we will be just like them and we will not have any longer the status of being lower than the angels but we will be equal to or like the angels and so we are temporarily lower, but we won't be eternally lower, all right? I'll find that other verse. If not tonight, I'll find it and share it with you next week. Uh, now... I have just looked at the wrong verse. That might be what the problem is, but let's see. I'm going to figure it out. Okay, let's keep it moving. So, just like Jesus was temporarily lower, we were temporarily lower. Okay, now this concept I wanted to mention is one that you can do some study on. But this is, when you notice in scripture, there are some references to angels and the letter that it starts with is a little or lowercase a, but then there are other references to angels where you see where it starts with a, a uppercase a. And, um, Oh, Let me see if my angel helped me out. It's probably a typo. That's probably what it is. Okay. Yeah, you're right. It's Luke 20, not Luke 10. Luke 20, I had a typo. Thank you so much. Bless your heart. Luke 20, verses 34 to 36 is what I was looking for. Jesus answered and said to them, the sons of this age marry and are given in marriage, but those who are counted worthy to attain that age and the resurrection from the dead neither marry nor are given in marriage, nor can they die anymore, for they are equal to the angels and are sons of God, being sons of the resurrection. So at that point, we become exalted and we will be equal with them. We will no longer be lower than. We will be resurrected. Remember, we'll have celestial bodies and that is a whole nother teaching. So 
not going to try to go down that avenue. The key is we will no longer walk in flesh and blood. So now we'll be equal to them. All right. Thank you. All right. <clears throat> so capital A. I always find it fascinating the times when in scripture we see capital A used to begin with the angel versus lower case. Now, some say, oh, it doesn't matter. Something you can study, but let's look at a few examples. Genesis chapter 16. And look at verse 10. <clears throat> Genesis 16 and 10. <laughs> says let me go um back a little bit so you get the picture this is the time when hagar the the black woman who uh was impregnated by abraham because sarah couldn't be patient for god to give her her own child so she said sleep with my maid servant now i don't know about you I've never been that impatient. <laughs> There's never been a time where I thought, oh, let me tell my husband to sleep with somebody else. Even when I miscarried several times, that thought never occurred to me. <laughs> Different kind of woman. I'm just trying to tell somebody. But anyway, Sarah said sleep with Hagar. Of course, Hagar is a young, beautiful Egyptian woman. And there was no argument from Abraham. And so he did his duty. She became pregnant. Now there's some friction, you know. Now she kind of smelling herself as Sarah felt. And she thinks she all that because she's pregnant. And Abraham again didn't speak up and allow Sarah to be uh somewhat sounding like almost abusive toward her, certainly harsh. And so Hagar ran away. So if you look, go back to uh, verse six in chapter 16 of Genesis. So Abram said to Sarah, indeed your maid is in your hand, do to her as you please, not good leadership. And when Sarah dealt harshly with her, she fled from her presence. Verse seven, now the angel of the Lord found her, notice that capital A, the angel of the Lord found her by a spring of water in the wilderness, by the spring on the water to Shur. And he said, Hagar, Sarah's maid, where have you come from and where are you going? She said, I'm fleeing from the presence of my mistress, Sarah. The angel of the Lord said to her, return to your mistress and submit yourself under her hand. And then the angel of the Lord said to her, I will multiply your descendants exceedingly so that they shall not be counted for a multitude. And the angel of the Lord said to her, behold, you are with child and you shall bear a son. You shall call his name Ishmael because the Lord has heard your affliction. He shall be a wild man. His hand shall be against every man and every man's hand against him. And he shall dwell in the presence of all his brothers. And of course you do the search, research, you'll find that it's Ishmael's offspring who we now know in the Mideast that are fighting with the Israelites. They've been fighting for centuries, eons even. This was the beginning. But the point is capital A, Notice that's a parallel kind of promise that Abraham was given about his life, that he was going to multiply him and his descendants would be so many they couldn't be numbered. So he gave a similar prophetic word to uh, uh, Hagar about her son, but I don't want you to miss this. Think about this. We are talking about an angel that is speaking to Hagar, an angel. If an angel is speaking, why does he use the word I? He didn't say God will. He said I will. Let me read it to you again. He said, the angel of the Lord, verse 9, said to her, return to your mistress and submit yourself on her hand. Then the angel of the Lord said to her, I will multiply your descendants exceedingly so that they might not be counted for multitude. That sounds like a proclamation that God himself would make. And there are many who have studied angels that would suggest when you see that capital A, what you're experiencing or observing is the pre-incarnate Christ, the Lord himself prior to him 
incorporating himself into the form of a man, having come and made a visitation. Now, type of thing that you can spend time doing some research on is something that I've done some research on, but I haven't delved all the way into it. But from various places in scripture, you start looking at the words and the language and you start hearing words that sound not as much of what someone might say if they were representing God as it is God himself, incarnate or pre-incarnate. And it's just something to think about. Let me look at some other examples. All right. Where was we? Okay, verses chapter 17. Look at verse 1. When Abraham was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am Almighty God. Walk before me and be blameless. And I will make my covenant between you and me and will multiply you exceedingly. That's parallel kind of language, what we just saw. Now go down to verse 20. And as for Ishmael, I have heard you. Behold, I have blessed him and will make him fruitful and will multiply him exceedingly. He shall beget 12 princes and I will make him a great nation. So who's talking? He said the Lord. Yet when we were hearing him talk to Hagar about Ishmael, it says the angel. So again, one of those areas where minds differ and how they view it, but many think this was a pre-incarnate visitation of Jesus when he came and spoke to Hagar. And he's sort of cor uh, uh, confirming what he said to her. He's saying that Abraham, because of course, as Abraham's seed, he's the oldest, though he was not the chosen or the child of the promise, if you will, he's still Abraham's son and God still blessed him. And notice he has, 12 sons sound like the 12 sons of Jacob, 12 disciples, 12 sons. And there's been a fight over that land that they occupy in the Middle East ever since. All right, let's look at another example. <clears throat> Excuse me. Judges chapter 13. Judges chapter number 13, verse 16. Okay, Judges 13, 16 says, and the angel of the Lord, again in my Bible, that's a capital A, said to Manoah, though you detain me, I will not eat your food. But if you offer a burnt offering, you must offer it to the Lord. For Manoah did not know he was the angel of the Lord. Then Manoah said to the angel of the Lord, what is your name that when your words come to pass, we may honor you? And the angel of the Lord said to him, why do you ask my name, saying it is wonderful? Now, again, if you think about what Isaiah says about Jesus, what does he say? Wonderful counsel. Is this a pre-incarnate visitation? Something you can do some study on. I would submit that every parallel <clears throat> Um, every parallel is something that is consistent with him being God, him being the Lord, uh, the words, the way he addresses the people that he encounters. And even this, my name is wonderful. Who else is going to say that one has to at least answer that question? And again, it's one of those things you can do some research on. Then Exodus chapter three and two. And I'm gonna give you some of these and you can look them up yourself, but these are all the same types of examples. Exodus three and two. You can write this down. Exodus three and two, Exodus 3.14, Exodus 21 and 22. So Exodus 3 and 2. 
says, and the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire from the midst of a bush. So he looked and behold, the bush was burning with fire, but the bush was not consumed. Then Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush does not burn. And you know that famous scene, you remember if you ever watched the Ten Commandments, where God uses a burning bush to get Moses' attention when he called him. He was out on the backside of the desert, he had run away because he had killed an Egyptian and he didn't want Pharaoh to kill him. And so God called him to go back to set his people free. And when you uh, look at it again, capital A, beginning for the angel, it says the angel of the Lord, but who's actually speaking to him? It's God calling him. It's not an angel calling him, right? So look at it. Verse 14, and God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, thus you shall say to the children of Israel, I am has sent me to you. Wait a minute. A minute ago, you said that scripture said it was the angel of the Lord. This is the same conversation. So what does that suggest to us? Again, we see God speaking pre-incarnate. Uh, verse 21, and I will give this people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. Again, who I will, who is I? God, in verse 22. So all of these are examples of when we see that capital A that we believe potentially we're looking at a vis divine visitation, not merely an angel visiting. Let's look at Joshua 5.15. When we think about the words that are spoken, the words are what catches my attention because they are words that only God can say. Joshua 5, 15 and Exodus 3, 2 through 5 was where I just read with the burning bush. Um, 5, 15 says, and the princes of Issachar were with Deborah as Issachar so was Barak sent Oh, I'm in the wrong book. I'm like something wrong. <laughs> been judges, my bad. And that sounds a little strange. Pardon me. Let's go back to Joshua. One book back. Okay, now Joshua 5:15. The commander of the Lord's army said to Joshua, "Take your sandal off your foot, for the place where you stand is holy." And Joshua did so. Remember, I talked about this and how. Joshua said, whose side are you on? He said, you know, I, I represent the Lord. But let's think about it. Who else had that express? When Moses saw the burning bush and the angel of the Lord, capital A, spoke to him and then began saying, I am the greater, you know, I am that I am and so forth. If he told Moses, take off your feet, shoes, you're, in, you're on holy ground. We don't typically see angels say that kind of thing. We typically see that being something that represents the fact that you're in the presence of God. When you're in his reverence, in his presence, you reverence him. And so God's usually the one that would say, take off your shoes. You're in, you're in my presence. Honor me. This is holy ground. Whereas in the instance uh, where we see it with Joshua, it's the commander of the army. So who can that be? Remember I said it's potentially Michael as the leader but it could be the Lord Jesus himself. Interesting thing to consider. And I will submit to you, I'm convinced that when we see that capital A, that it does represent difference, a difference between when you see, lack of a better word, general angels <laughs> versus the angel of the Lord himself. And so again, it's one of those things you can dig deeper in and uh, decide for yourself. All right. Okay. Let's see here. Exodus 14. Write this down. Exodus 14, verse 19, 20. And then Exodus 23, verse 20. All of these are the type of examples that we've seen before. First Corinthians chapter 10, verse 1 through 4. Let's look at that. First Corinthians. A scripture. It says, moreover, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware that all our fathers were under the cloud, all passed through the sea, 
and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea, and all ate the same spiritual food, and all drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them. When you read that uh, Exodus passage that I share with you, you'll see the rock accompanied them every day, uh, and they followed the rock. What does it say? That rock followed them, and that rock was Christ. So I always used to think about that. You know, when Moses got to the promised land and God wouldn't let him go in, Moses struck the rock. Could it be that he struck Jesus? When God says, speak to the rock, he struck the rock. And God said, you are not going into the promised land. It's just an interesting thought, something I've always pondered, something that you can dig deeper in. But the point I'm making is, we have opportunities in scripture to see the presence of the Lord before we saw Jesus as the baby and then grown up man clothed in flesh. Okay. Let's see here. All right. Now, here's some things we know about angels. We know that they serve us uh, as ushers, if you will. Look at Luke chapter 16. When you die, and we all are gonna die in the flesh, but not in the spirit, thank you, Lord. How do you get to heaven? Well, let's look at it. Luke chapter 16, verse 23 says, so, uh, let me back up, back up, back up, back up. Let's go back to verse 19. Luke 16, 19. There was a certain rich man who was clothed in purple, purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. But there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, full of sores, who was laid at his gate, desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. So it was that the beggar died. Look at that. The beggar died and was carried by angels to Abraham's bosom. They were our, they are our ushers. I'm sure if you've ever watched that show, um, used to come on one of the angel shows. You always had the angel of death that would show up to usher that person. But there is a scriptural basis. The angels came and carried him to Abraham's bosom. But watch this. The rich man also died and was buried. And being in torment in Hades, I mean, he went down. He didn't go up. He lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham afar and Lazarus in his bosom. So what's the point? You get angelic ushers to take you to the very presence of God. Or you don't. In which case, you're going in a different direction. All right? They're not married. We just saw in Matthew 22. Let's look back at it real quick. And this is where I believe when people say, oh, now he's an angel. Oh, now she's an angel. That doesn't say it, but this is probably the basis for why people say that. If you look at 22, uh, chapter 22 of Matthew, verse 29, Jesus answered and said to them, you are mistaken, not knowing the scripture nor the power of God. For in the resurrection, they, were ne they neither marry nor are given in marriage. There will be no high divorce rate because everybody can be married. But are like angels of God in heaven. And I believe that's why people have said, oh, now she's an angel. They are like them in a the symbolic sense. They're spirit beings. They shed the uh, flesh. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. But it doesn't say they're going to be angels. Because they could have said that. They wouldn't, he wouldn't have to say they are like he could have said they would be angels but concerning the resurrection okay i'm not going with that so my point is i believe that's the basis upon which we hear people say things like oh she's an angel now let's look at jude chapter nine we saw how they how uh, michael treated the devil when he dealt with it this is one of those areas where people debate you know how do you how do you respond to the enemy? 
Luke chapter nine. And there's some who go to the extreme of, oh, you shouldn't say anything to him or you shouldn't be harsh to the devil in any kind of way. You know, look at Jesus as a model. That's what I go by. June, Jude chapter nine, I mean, verse nine, you know, there's only one chapter of Jude. Yet Michael and, and the Michael, the archangel in contending with the devil, because the devil is trying to steal Moses' bones and contending with the devil when he disputed about the body of Moses, dared not bring against him a reviling accusation, but said, the Lord rebuked you. And so uh, I know uh, Pastor Jesus is one of those people who's very adamant about how, you know, when you're praying, you going back and forth. One minute you're talking to God, next minute you're talking to the devil, and, I, and that makes perfectly logical sense. You don't stop in the middle and, you know, you're talking to God, you're talking to the devil and so forth. Um, but he's the one that says, Lord, rebuke the devil. He won't rebuke the devil. And so he's going by scripture. And so my suggestion is follow the man of God. Uh, follow the word of God. And also look at the example. How did Jesus talk to the, the devil? Every time they encounter each other, Jesus would say, it is written. He didn't have to rebuke him. He told him what the word of God said. I'm not doing what you just said. It's written. My father has said. And so when we encounter demonic things, we speak the truth. He did say we can bind the strong man. So he gave us the authority to bind any demonic thing. But as far as rebuking, reviling, you know, we can follow the example of Michael. Uh, some even theorize that they were perverse angels, you know, the fallen ones. Look at Genesis chapter six. Genesis chapter six. How are we doing? We doing good. Praise God. Genesis chapter six. How y'all doing? Y'all still with me? Okay, Genesis 6, 1 through 5 says, Now it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth that, <clears throat> excuse me, it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born to them that the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were beautiful and they took wives for themselves of all whom they chose. And we've seen that reference, sons of God. So go back to Job. You see where they were referred to that way. And we believe they were talking about the angels. Remember the sons of God presented themselves and then the devil came too when they went before the Lord. So he just says the sons of God saw these women, said they were beautiful and they took wives. Well, of course we know that would be a perversion because they are spirit beings. They were never intended to take wives. And so some don't even, uh, if you will, accept this as what it appears to be, but some do believe. And so that uh, the, the fallen angels slept with women. Verse three, and the Lord said, my spirit shall not strive with man forever, for it is indeed flesh, yet his days shall be 120 years. Prior to that, we would have lived forever just like the Lord. There were giants on the earth in those days. And also afterward, when the sons of God came to the daughters of men, see that? Sons of God, daughters of men. And they bore children to them. Those were the mighty men who were of old men of renown. And so they were giants. And so many say that was because of the birth of children that came from the intermarrying of angels and human beings. Uh, and, you know, not long after that, God said to Noah, I'm done with these folks because they don't want to obey me. I'm going to wipe everybody out. Just you and your children, the few animals, that's it. Everybody else I'm wiping out by flood. And so that's when he told Noah to begin to build the ark. And he destroyed that whole generation. So, again, one of those areas you can do some research. But there are many who believe that there was a perversion that came about as a result of the intermarrying of the fallen angels, taking on the form of men, of course. And, <clears throat> excuse me, therefore, um, they produced these offspring that were giants, okay? So these are the types of 
different topics you can get into with angels. There's so much material on angels, so many references to angels. I'm amazed every time I look at angels, how much more there is. Um, how many believe they've ever encountered an angel? I believe I have. I've shared some of my testimony. Uh, but many have, as the scripture said, encountered angels and don't even know it. We talked about them being ministers, about them being messengers, and even being immortal. You know, they don't age. You know, the same uh, Daniel 10, 4 through 14 is where Gabriel talked to Daniel. The same Gabriel is the same Gabriel that went and talked to uh, Mary when she got pregnant with God. Now we've gone from Old Testament to New Testament. Hundreds of uh, years have passed. So that lets us know angels are not subject to aging the way we do. Um, they're obedient. If you look at um, <laughs> chapter 22 of Numbers, you probably remember this story uh, because Balaam was trying to curse the people of God when God told him not to. You know, he was being bribed by a, a crooked king who said, I'll give you a bunch of money if you curse them people. You know, when they were coming up out of Egypt, they were taking names, so to speak, and conquering uh, lands. And so the king knew they were coming, so they would curse them so they won't be able to come and overtake us. But of course, you can't curse what God has blessed. Somebody say hallelujah. Verse 22 of Numbers 22. Then God's anger was aroused because he went. The, Balaam knows, you know, prophet of God, you have no business trying to uh, curse God's people. And he told him, if you look at verse 20, and God came to Balaam at night and said to him, if the men come to call you, rise and go with them, but only the words which I speak to you, that shall you do. But he went on trying to go and make some money because the uh, king kept offering him more and more money. <clears throat> Excuse me. So verse 22, then God's anger was aroused because he went and the angel of the Lord took his stand in the way as an adversary against him. And he was riding on his donkey and his two servants were with him. Now the donkey saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way with his drawn sword in his hand and the donkey turned aside out of the way and went into the field. So Balaam struck the donkey to turn her back onto the road. I know this is, I don't want to sound sexist, but the woman was a, the female donkey tried to look out for him and tell him what to do. <laughs> and all too often when we try to tell you something, you know what, well, listen, then you get yourself <laughs> in a mess. But anyway, that's another story. It just was curious to me. I always remember that. That's the only time in scripture I've ever seen an animal referred to as her. Uh, but each time she would turn away because she saw the angel, but Balaam was so blind that he couldn't see the angel. And then eventually the angel showed himself to Balaam and said, dummy, if it wasn't for your, dun your uh, donkey, I'd have killed you by now. And you can go back and read that. Verses 22 through 35 in the book of, of Numbers chapter 22. And then, of course, we know they are protectors. Uh, we've read several of those stories in Acts where they took, uh, uh, they watched over Paul and Silas in prison and the, and the walls and the doors shook and the doors opened and Peter got out because the angel came and took him out. Uh, another time the angel came and took Peter and uh, and I believe it was John with him and they he told him to go stand in the square. So you can read all that. Acts chapter 12, verse 2 through 10, 27. Chapter 27, verse 21 to 25. All that's in Acts. And that's a great, great book. If you've never sat down and read the book of Acts, you are missing a blessing. You'll feel like Popeye. You finish reading Acts like you just ate your can of spinach. It'll make you feel powerful because you see the power of God. Okay? Now, amen. We have so many different stories and so many different scripture about angels. We could spend another 10 weeks on this thing, but that is not practical. So I wanted to give you a good primer. Here's a book that I would recommend. I had to find mine 
last week after class, I started looking for it. And then Margaret so happened, she found one in a thrift store and reminded me to keep looking because I couldn't remember where I put it. This is by Billy Graham, called Angels. And he talked about when he wanted to do some preaching on angels, he could find all these books about demons and the, the devil, but he could find no books about angels. And so he said that was not good. And we talking more about the devil than we are about God's angels. Um, he gave several powerful testimonies. One was really uh, amazing. A little girl in the middle of the night woke a doctor up back in the, sounds like 1800s. And it was a blistery cold night. And the doctor had finally gotten asleep in the bed because he had had a long day. You know, back then they would come to you. They, you didn't have your patients come to your office. You go like make house calls. So he was really tired. And the little girl knocked on the door and said, please come. My mommy is very, very ill, you know. And he said, he was so tired. He said, but she was so persistent. He got up, he went. The lady was near death. So he was able to save her. And he said, it's a good thing that your daughter came to get me. And she said, my daughter? She said, my daughter died six months ago. And he said, huh? And he said it was snowy. So his coat was wet. She said her coat is hanging right there in the closet. He opened a closet door and the exact coat that the little girl had on was hanging there in the closet, but it was dry. It hadn't been outside. And he knew that God had sent an angel to save that woman. Um, there's so many examples. Janet gave a powerful testimony. Our sister here, Janet, that's from Belief, how she was uh, going to church on a Christmas and her clutch went out. She said, this old gentleman came, looked like Santa Claus, beard and all. He came, helped push her car up a hill. You know, it's hard to push a car. Pushed the car up a hill by itself, got her safe, then took her, he, she said, back then we didn't have cell phones. So he drove her 15 minutes to get to a, a pay, boot, pay phone. Some of y'all don't even know what that is. <laughs> yeah. And then sat there with her while she called her family. The phone was busy, busy, busy. Y'all know nothing about a busy signal. Back then, if your phone was busy, that means you were on the phone. You couldn't click over. Wasn't nothing to click to. Until recent, and then more later, we were able to get two-way and three-way. But the point is, she finally said she called her neighbor. And then he took her back to the car. And she said when she got settled in the car, she looked around and he had disappeared. He was just gone. That being said, we are um, grateful for the angels who watch up for us. And they show up and we don't even know it. We don't know what they look like. That little girl, likely an angel. That old man. Likely an angel. So we don't know. That's why the scripture said, be kind to everybody, because you don't know who you may be dealing with. You might be entertaining angels and don't even know it. Amen. Is there anybody here that needs to give your life to Christ? The key thing is, God is real. Angels are real. Heaven is real. So is hell. And so it would not behoove you to let this opportunity pass. Sadly, we don't have any guarantee of tomorrow. Yeah. Thank you, Lord. Amen and amen. amen. All right, ladies. Well, have a good night. We'll see you next week for our last class next week. Have a good week. Love you. Bye. 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 Bye.